Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, Hudson Institute. My name is Miles Yu. I am the director of uh, Hudson Institute's China Center here uh, in Washington, D.C. Today, we have the privilege to host uh, uh, a talk on a very important topic by a supremely qualified speaker. Uh, th this event will, um, will last for about an hour, and uh, it will begin with uh, remarks by uh, our uh, distinguished speaker and followed by a conversation between me and our speaker, and then open up to a Q&A for the general audience. So get ready, get your questions ready. Uh, our speaker today has an uh, outstanding career and uh, that deserves a, uh, a, a much larger space to introduce. But due to time constraint, uh, we have provided a full bio on, the, um, uh, on your seat uh, here in the live audience. Uh, for our C-SPAN audience, uh, and if you want to uh, see the full uh, biography of our speaker, please visit our uh, website uh, at hudson.org, Hudson, uh, at hudson.org, um, uh, that's basically it is, it is uh, the website. Uh, and I'm going to basically here highlight a few um, um, uh, important uh, uh, aspect of our um, distinguished uh, um, speaker's career. Uh, Ambassador Robert O'Brien is a co-founder and chairman of American Global Strategies, LLC. Uh, he was the 27th United States National Security Advisor from 2019 to 2021. Ambassador O'Brien served as the President's Principal Advisor on all aspects of American foreign policy and national security affairs. Uh, during his tenure as a National Security Advisor, to the president, Ambassador O'Brien orchestrated the history, the historic uh, Abraham's Accords, uh, achieved significant defense spending among our NATO allies, and strengthened our alliance in the Indo-Pacific. He has received numerous awards throughout his illustrious career. In 2022, he was elected as the chairman of the board for the Richard Nixon Foundation, and has been co-chairing with our own Secretary Mike Pompeo the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. Ambassador O'Brien received a D JD from UC Berkeley, which is also uh, my own uh, alma mater, uh, and a BA in Political Science from UCLA. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Honorable Ambassador Robert O'Brien. Thank you, Miles. Thank you. I think that calls for Go Bears with uh, Cal. It's, uh, we're back here in Washington. There's a lot of Harvard and Yale and uh, not as many Cal and, and Stanford and UCLA guys, but uh, Miles, great to be with you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so Miles did tremendous work for us at the State Department during the last administration as a senior advisor to the secretary. And I think you were an SP in policy and planning and uh, led our, our China efforts on a number of fronts and did a terrific just a terrific job for us. So thank you, Miles, for your service to the country and, and for that kind introduction. So my, my mom will appreciate uh, watching that, uh, so thank you. Great to be here at Hudson. I've got some good friends here, I mean, Arthur Herman and, and many others who are fellows here at Hudson. And this is one of the great think tanks in Washington. And what, what's great about Hudson is it really dives down into the issues and, and uh, gets to the bottom of things and punches way above its weight. And, and you know, in, in Washington circles, the folks here at the Hudson Institute uh, play a, a, a bigger than life role in, in our public, public policy debate. So again, honored to be in, in such a great uh, think tank and institution. So it seems like everything I do these days, uh, we're here to talk about China uh, and uh, specifically the, the Chinese Communist Party. And you know, it's, it's one of those mixed things. I, I, I've been to China many times in the past. I, I can't go now. They've disinvited me uh, permanently, but uh, from Hong Kong, China, Macau. But the Chinese people are great people, and, and Chinese Americans play such an important role in our, our country, and great immigrants. Uh, but unfortunately, they're, they're governed by the, a regime that, uh, that wants to change our way of life. And, uh, and, and as Miles and I were talking before the uh, uh, speech today, they're relentless. They're across every sector, they're across every region of the world. Uh, everybody, whether you're in the South Pacific or Europe or Africa, uh, whatever your specialty is, China is at the top of your agenda because the Chinese are, are relentless in trying to change the, 
the way that we, we live our lives. They're trying to change our liberty, change our way of life, and change the way the world is organized. And, uh, and that's dangerous. And so specifically today, I want to talk about competitiveness. I want to focus on, and there, there are so many areas we could talk about robotics and AI and quantum and EVs and AVs and batteries, but I want to focus at least for these initial remarks before we get into our Q&A with, with Dr. Yu, uh, I want to talk about semiconductors. And semiconductor technology is one of those things that's ubiquitous. I mean, everything we do, everybody here probably has an iPhone or an Android phone. You've got a semiconductor on you right now, and you probably don't think about it. The camera has a semiconductor in it, many, in fact, many semiconductors. Everything we have from F-35s at the, at the high end, at the, the cutting edge, uh, all, all the way to your washing machine to the, to the F-150 I've got in my garage, uh, it all depends on, on semiconductors. And the, so there's critical, critical infrastructure. And the supply of those semiconductors is critical, again, to how we live in a modern society. And so the US is investing $52 billion in the CHIPS Act uh, to, to bring semiconductor factories uh, back to America, uh, improve our fabrication plants and our capability in the semiconductor sector, and, and secure our, our ability to live a modern life, uh, and, and, and literally enable our daily lives. Because without them, I think about this, without semiconductors, Almost every aspect of global manufacturing, not just American manufacturing, global manufacturing, comes to a halt. Uh, you know, we, we saw this in the pandemic. I, it took me, I had ordered an automobile, a truck, and it sat for months uh, waiting for a semiconductor. The, the truck was constructed, but it couldn't, couldn't leave the lot at the factory without the semiconductors it needed. So we, we saw backlogs not just there, but with, with people wanting to get refrigerators, washing machines, uh, Phones were even difficult to get. And so we saw what the backlogs uh, could happen with a, a fragile supply chain during the pandemic. But we also saw sky high prices, and we saw inflation as a result. Now, not surprisingly, given the importance of semiconductors, the CCP, the Communist Party of China, has sought to dominate the market. And not just the market for the super advanced three and four nanometer semiconductors, but for what we call the mature semiconductors, the, the commodity semiconductors or legacy semiconductors. They want to control the market. Now, we can't eliminate our reliance on semiconductors. That, that, that's something we can't do. But what we can do is minimize the risk that Beijing poses if they get control, a monopoly control of semiconductors the way they do, for example, with rare earth elements. And, uh, and they become the leading, world's leading supplier of chips, uh, both legacy and advanced. So diversification of our semiconductor supply chain is one of the areas that we're on the cusp of achieving. And, and you know, I, I got a lot of criticism for this stance on supporting the CHIPS Act. Secretary, Secretary Pompeo did, Secretary Ross did, because it smacked on the, on the Republican side of industrial policy, of, of market, of the government mar managing the market. Uh, but it was something that was critical to our national security, and, and that's why a number of us on the GOP side stepped in to do something that would kind of have been an anathema to us, uh, maybe in the past, on, on the CHIPS Act. So with geopolitical challenges and uh, unprecedented in a generation, not just in China, but what we're facing in Russia, China's ally in Ukraine and in Europe uh, with Iran, uh, securing the supply of chips, particularly semiconductors that, that enable our military uh, industrial complex uh, is just critical. Now, we can't do it alone. Uh, we used to talk in the Trump administration about what we called an America first foreign policy. You know, I called that a peace or strength foreign policy, uh, harkening back to Ronald Reagan. It wasn't something that President Trump invented and peace through strength goes back to Roman times. But uh, the idea is America first is not America alone. And so we need to work with our allies to secure the supply chain in the semiconductor area. We can't, this is not just an America, an American project. It's, a, it's a, what I'd call the West. And when I talk about the West, I'm talking about the idea of the West. That would include Japan, South Korea, Australia, and Oceania. Uh, so collaboration between chip and software designers in the US software developers in the Netherlands and, and equipment manufacturers in Holland, uh, manufacturers across the globe, especially in China, uh, excuse me, in Taiwan, uh, Republic of China, uh, Japan, Korea. All of that has improved our, our, our situation vis-a-vis -vis China. But this cooperation is, it has to continue, and it's, it's critical to, uh, uh, if we're going to de-risk the business and supply chains, and if we're going to secure our ability to maintain our way of life, not just our liberty and our, our principles, but how we, how we manage ourselves in a modern society. So just a few years ago, and we all know this, China's economic rise provided a lot of hope. 
we had this idea that, and I'll talk about this in the context of semiconductors, but just more generally, if we turned a blind eye to, to human rights abuses, if we turned a blind eye to Tiananmen Square and Xinjiang and, and Tibet, if we turned a blind eye to the extinguishing of democracy in Hong Kong, which violated the British Sino Pact, uh, if, we, if we allowed the continued theft of our intellectual property, if we allowed unfair trade practices, if we did all these things, China would become richer. And, they, and in turn, they'd become more like us. And they'd, they'd become part of the kind of a global democratic uh, world. And we saw just the opposite happen. What did we see? We saw uh, China that became more autocratic, more tyrannical. They, they, they used all the, the blessings of, of, the, of their membership in the WTO and their, their blind activities to, to develop a surveillance society, something that George Orwell would have been astounded by, I mean, with social credit scores and cameras everywhere and, and uh, uh, a way of life that, that's an anathema to, to us in the West. No privacy, no liberty. Uh, and, and so we'd hoped that they'd become different, but they haven't. And, and as they've recently demonstrated, the uh, Chinese Communist Party is not interested in becoming a thriving economic part partner. Instead, Beijing in, intends and it seeks to upend the entire global economic order and place itself at the top of that order. Uh, Chairman Xi Jinping has made se semiconductors, but China 2025 is what we all talk about now, which you know, deals with robotics and AI and quantum, all of which are dependent on semiconductors. But going back to the third party plenum in 2000, 2000, 2013, the CCP has spent over a trillion yuan trying to become the dominant player and dominant power in the world in semiconductors. And they call it the big fund in China, and they want to have an industry that dominates the, the entire sector. So, they, and like many things the Chinese have done, they've been successful. Right? We, we constantly underestimate the Chinese. I'll just jump to a, an example of a carrier aircraft. When the Chinese bought the old Russian carrier, the Variag, it was in Ukraine, and we were going to make it a casino, and they spent a lot of years refurbishing it, we said, they're never going to be able to understand carrier aviation. It's going to take them 20, 30, 50 years to, to do it. Not only do they understand carrier aviation, they're building three of their own carriers. They're, they're demonstrating that they can operate at sea and, and integrate their carrier air wing with their, their ships, uh, land and, and, and uh, launch uh, the sorties on a rapid basis from their carriers. We underestimate the Chinese, and, to our, and we do that to our own, our own detriment. And we, we shouldn't because they're, they're hardworking people, they're clever as heck, and, uh, and they're motivated. They, they want to win, especially the, the party. So in 2011, China had 1,300 registered companies in the semiconductor industry. By 2020, they had over 22,000 companies in the semiconductor industry. And, and it's only grown since 2020. And the, Beijing is in, uh, providing significant incentives to allow these companies to produce semiconductor chips at, at scale. And uh, granted, most of these companies are focused on legacy chips and mature chips and not the, the uh, super advanced chips. But while these are less technically advanced uh, than their smaller counterparts, these, these chips are still critical parts of our, of our infrastructure and our industries in, in the US, including defense. And what's amazing is that the United States and our, our defense industry are still buying chips, mature chips, semiconductors made in China and integrating them into our defense platforms and systems, uh, which is incredibly dangerous. So we've got to wean ourselves off dependence on Chinese chips, uh, including the legacy chips. And if we, if we don't, we're vulnerable to, to supply chain disruptions that we saw in the pandemic. And that's, that's worse for a couple of reasons. Number one, it provides economic leverage for the Chinese Communist Party to affect our policies. But number two, in the event of a conflict, heaven forbid, uh, especially one of the Taiwan Straits, there, there's no way our defense industry is going to be able to continue to buy chips from China in that situation. Moreover, those chips are vulnerable to spyware and malware that's, that's embedded in the, in the hard chips that go into our systems, putting our warfighters at risk. So they could uh, deliberately choke us off. And, uh, and, and coercion, as we know, is, is the method by which the CCP seeks to promote its own interests. Uh, the CCP sees economic interdependence and engagement and integration as folly. Uh, they believe in, they, they talk about win-win, but really in the CCP's world, it's win-lose. China wins, everyone else loses. And in Xi Jinping's eyes, the only way China can win is if everyone else loses. So China's ambitions have become clear, and we've got to address those ambitions head-on. Uh, their military exercises, their propaganda, 
The coercive export control seek to undermine the stability of our partners, the Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, Japan, and Korea. And we saw this with the, the cutoff of rare earth minerals uh, a few years ago when China was unhappy with Japanese policy and they, they threatened to cut off, and it actually did for a time, cut off rare earth minerals to, to Japan. This is standard practice. So with the theft of American intellectual property, uh, continued unfair trade practices, China and Chinese firms have flagrantly disregarded our national law and international law. Fortunately, businesses have begun to wake up to the threat and the reality of what the, the risks that China poses, not just to our country, not just to our national security, but to our business and, our, uh, and our, uh, the, 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 the individual economies of the businesses that are relying on China. And so the, the US and its allies need to find ways to cooperate. We need to figure out with our supply chains how we onshore, reshore, friendshore, and, and work with trusted partners. Again, we can't do this alone. It's, it's got to be a, uh, a, a group effort in the West and among what I'll call the free world to, to make sure that our supply chains for everyone, for Korea, for Holland, for the UK, for the EU, for African countries that, that choose not to go down the Belt and Road uh, route, uh, that for the countries that don't want to be under the boot of Beijing, that don't want a social credit score, that don't want HIC vision and, and cameras recording the lives of their citizens, that don't want to give up all their medical and genetic information to the Communist Party of China. For the countries that want to remain free and have a way of life, we've got to band together and create supply chains uh, that, are, that are, are safe and secure. And doing so, unfortunately, in, in this day and age when we were in a strained budget, uh, strained budget environment, we just went through the whole debt ceiling situation, uh, it's going to be difficult. It's going to take, take added cost. It's going to take added effort. Uh, it's going to take, uh, again, a little bit of what uh, uh, us free marketeers uh, don't like on the industrial policy side. But to fail to do so would be to subject the United States and our allies and friends to unprecedented risk and, uh, and in my view, would be reckless. So one of America's greatest advantages, and I used to talk about this a lot when I was in office as National Security Advisor, uh, is that we have real allies. I mean, when you look at it, China doesn't have allies. They've got maybe Pakistan, maybe North Korea. They buy allies, they rent allies, but they don't have real allies. We have allies in America. We have allies that share, they're like-minded, that share our values, that share our beliefs, that, that believe in liberty, the rule of law, and open markets. And so for us to best compete in the semiconductor market against China, and in any tech sector for that matter, whether it's robotics or, or quantum or, or AI or uh, cyber or space, uh, we've got to do some cooperation and obviously there will be comp competition between individual companies, but we've got to do some cooperation with our friends and allies. So through engagements like this one and, and the important discussion that, that we'll have with uh, Miles and, uh, and all of you, this is how we start to, to raise the awareness of the American people of what's happening. And there, 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 uh, Arthur Herman and I wrote an article recently in Foreign Affairs that kind of laid out some of the things we should be doing in America, not just on semiconductors, but across the, the, all sectors and, and all regions. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, again, to protect our way of life. Uh, but the, these sorts of engagements and Hudson's promotion of, of the rule of law and liberty is, is, is what we're going to do to... <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that, to, to educate the American people and, and maintain our, our way of life and, and protect our, our, our liberty and, and, and do so in a, in a, in a modern fashion. Uh, we're not just going to be agricultural people, we're going to be modern people, we're going to have technology, we're going to remain the leaders in tech, uh, and we can do it as Americans. And, and I'm, again, the... The punchline for this is that as big as a challenge that the CCP presents, at the end of the day, uh, I'd bet every, every single day, every single hour, every single minute on, on the United States of America, on the people that are here, and on our like-minded friends and allies that we're going we're gonna to prevail in this, in this competition between tyranny and autocracy and, and liberty and the rule of law. And, uh, and we're going to do it in a way that maintains our economy and maintains our, uh, our prosperity. So thank you very much. Look forward to chatting with Miles and look forward to taking your questions. God bless you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, you, uh, and uh, that was a very, very good uh, uh, opening remarks. Uh, let's just say, uh, uh, you know, supply chain is a chain. Uh, a chain consists of many links. Some links are strong, some links are weak. Um, in your opinion, what do you think, uh, you know, uh, are the strongest <laughs> links uh, on the American side? What would be the strongest link on the China side? And uh, there's a link, weak link and, and a strong link, too, on both sides. Yeah, so that's a good question. I think the, the strongest thing we've got going in America and our allies, uh, Japan, uh, especially on, on the chips uh, area, 
but, but across the board, is our ability to do research and development, our innovation, our creativity. So when you look at the innovators that we've got here and, and our allies, and I was just recently in Japan, was recently in Taiwan, uh, freedom breeds this, this entrepreneurial spirit and this innovative spirit. And so I think in the, in the free world in the West, our, our strongest uh, area is, is innovation, entrepreneurship, new ideas uh, that, that are eventually knocked off and stolen by the Chinese. But I think we, we can maintain our advantage through our innovation. I think that what the Chinese have done, and it was, you know, I, I give them credit for it. I mean, they're, they're smart people, they had a plan. They hollowed out our industrial manufacturing capability. They basically took all our manufacturing and everything from, you know, it started out with toys and lower end things, but now it's at the semiconductor level, at the robotics level. They moved our manufacturing to China and, and to, to countries around China that they control or where they have controlling interest in the companies in some of the, the, the countries around China. And they, they, they moved that whole manufacturing sector uh, to China and parts of Asia, which they control. And it's going to be very difficult to replicate that. It's going to be very difficult to bring it home. I mean, we're seeing this with, that's why we had to have the CHIPS Act. Uh, and, and we're going to have to invest a lot of money to bring manufacturing back to America and back to our, our partners. And look, our partners are all over the world. I mean, Mexico is a great partner. Uh, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, I mean, Brazil in our hemisphere. But there are partners like Vietnam, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Australia. So we've got great partners. The Philippines, I think, and, and Thailand can be great partners in, in the manufacturing sector. India, but it's going to take a lot of effort uh, diplomatically and, and economically, and we're going to have to get our private sector involved. And, and they're going to have to understand that they risk leaving their manufacturing in China because if there is a conflict, you know, they're, they're, they don't own those factories. The CCP owns their factories, and they're going to lose them. So we've got to start thinking about how we, you know, I think the word the Biden administration uses now is de-risk, but I think it's more than that, how we protect our supply chains by moving them uh, out of China. But it's been an incredible strength for the Chinese because they really control manufacturing and pharma and rare earths and in so many important areas right now. And they've, they've done a good job of, of moving it from us. From, you know, Puerto Rico used to be a big pharmaceutical manufacturing area. Now it's gone. It's, it's, uh, those factories are sitting empty because that manufacturing is in China. And so, so that's their strength. Our strength, I think, is on the innovation front. Great, great. Now, um, we all mentioned uh, about uh, U.S.-China competition. Uh, the word competition is uh, <coughs> really uh, nice and uh, gentlemanly and genteel, as if uh, uh, competition only means um, something like uh, Berkeley, Stanford, Army, Navy, Harvard, Yale, um, with the assumption that both sides will basically you know, act uh, uh, very cordially and follow the same set of rules. Now, China and the United States are a completely different system, as you mentioned. Um, and. Uh, uh, they can, the, the state in China can command the entire economy. Uh, and U.S. government cannot really tell Apple and uh, uh, Google what to do. But we can only uh, give them advice, give them policy guidance <clears throat> on national security front. How do you actually compete if both sides are completely different? China's, uh, as you mentioned uh, very eloquently, you know, China's uh, definition of win is Americans' loss, right? So, um, uh, so it's not like, you know, Berkeley's win uh, 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 must rely on Stanford's complete destruction. <laughs> I mean, that would be good, uh, you know, but uh, uh, I mean, you know, being a UCLA Bruin, we used to think that about USC, but I've got softer feelings about USC now. So both great universities and Stanford's a great university as well. Uh, this is not a football competition. It's not a competition between you know, who's the top ranked school and second ranked school and the third ranked school. Uh, this is a competition about whose way of life is going to prevail. And as you mentioned, the Chinese don't play by the rules. Uh, the, the, the intellectual property theft that's taken place over the last 30, 40 years has been what Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, said two summers ago in a speech that he gave. The biggest transfer of human wealth in history has been the, the theft, not, not the, the economic development of China, which if it was done fairly, we'd all applaud, but the theft of American and Western intellectual property and the transfer of that to China. Biggest in human history. Now, I think a lot of you have been to Rome, you've seen the Trajan's column, and it shows you know, the Romans bringing back all the, the, the cartfuls, the ox cartfuls of, of Dacian loot that, that kept you know, Rome going for another 100 years with everything that they looted from Dacia. That, that used to be kind of considered the, the biggest theft of property in history. But, but what China has done makes what Trajan did in, in Dacia, Romania, the, that, that area of the world, 
You know, that, that, that's child's play, it's kindergarten. I mean, the, the Chinese have literally stolen uh, trillions of dollars from us. So when you talk about competition, it's hard to compete with someone who's stealing you know, everything in your house. If you're competing with your neighbor, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, but the Joneses are coming into your house and stealing all your stuff as soon as you buy it. That's not really a competition. And, uh, and there's going to be no way to keep up with China if we continue to allow this to happen. But it's just, it's just not on the theft part. If it was just stealing our IP, that would be bad enough. And, and we can talk more about that in a moment, how that plays out and, and hurts individual Americans. But it's the unfair trade practices. Uh, you know, it, it's, the, it's claiming to be a developing nation under WTO rules. It's violating all the, the norms of, of just human decency when it comes to climate. I mean, we talk about climate change here and the, the hot weather this summer and what we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about it because China is opening a new coal-fired plant every month. So even if we closed every coal plant in America and every coal plant in the West, China's building so many of them that it'll make no difference. I mean, the atmosphere is the same for all of us. It's the, the, the world's inter interconnected and across the Pacific. You know, if the Chinese are pumping you know, dirty coal-fired coal plant uh, emissions into the atmosphere, there's li very little we can do about it. It's the same with the Pacific Ocean. I mean, in the old days, conservationists cared about clean water and clean air. And, and they, I, hopefully they still do here in America, but the water in China is the dirtiest in the world. But what they've done in the Pacific Ocean, we, there, there's now an island. Think of this, there's an island bigger than the big island of Hawaii of garbage, plastic, floating around in the Pacific Ocean right now. Most of it came from the, the Chinese and from their shipping and their, their, uh, their ecological practices. So we've got this island of garbage, and no one cares. No one's calling the Chinese out on it. So it's very difficult for American companies and, and Western companies to abide by the rules, to, to do what the EPA tells them to do, do what OSHA tells them to do. I mean, we talk about worker safety, and, and the Chinese ship, shipyards are impressive. They, they launch these ships, you know, we launch two or three frigates, or two or three destroyers a year at best. They're launching a destroyer every month or a frigate every month. But they're massive. Uh, injuries that take place to Chinese workers. They, they lose 60, 70, 80 workers a year to deaths in the, in the shipyards. But when you go to Huntington Ingalls or Bath Iron Works or uh, uh, Newport News, they'll have signs up that say zero deaths or zero injuries for you know, 24 months, 36 months. So the, the way we treat workers, the way we treat our environment, the way we treat the, the, the rules we abide by aren't abided by the Chinese. So a very long answer to get to your, to get your question. It's hard to compete when someone's stealing from you when they're not abiding by the rules, when they're, uh, you know, any, anything goes, that's not a competition. And so we have to figure out a different way, a different model to, to, to deal with the Chinese. Yeah. So um, um, I'm gonna ask the last question before it goes to, to, to the audience for, uh, for, for questions. Um, recently, uh, a senior diplomat from a certain European country, and I shall not name the country, uh, which has a very, very heavy um, um, involvement with China, it was a policy also, is a very sort of, uh, shall we say, pro-China in a way. Um, and then um, we actually, uh, and this diplomat told me, when you look at the actual number, volume of investment of this particular country in China, uh, it's relatively small, based upon the argument, but it's concentrated on one or two big companies of that country. Most of the companies in that particular country uh, have divested, divested from China, because they realize there is tremendous risk of investment. Uh, investment is over a bottom line. If you cannot really guarantee a return, and the future is very uncertain, so re investment will not go there. Uh, so therefore, there is a de-risking versus decoupling. Um, why is that? If everybody recognizes China uh, investment is such a big re risk, why is that keep, 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 keep people like BlackRock and all the big companies keep putting money into the very business and venture? And how do you prevent that? So it's a great, great question. I mean, one of the things, we, every, every time we took an action against China, uh, uh, human rights abuses, democracy in Hong Kong, uh, the White House would get inundated with calls from the most famous businessmen on Wall Street complaining about what we were doing. Sometimes businessmen in the gaming industry upset with us for taking action against China. Uh, American companies, for the most part, in the tech sector have started to realize the risk of, of doing business in China. Now, selling to the Chinese is great. I mean, that reduces our trade deficit, gives them the products they need. But when you go into business in China and you, you get, have to do a joint venture with a Chinese company, you have to have a political commissar in your, from the CCP in your company telling you what you can and can't do. 
uh, when you have to turn over all your data and your information on your company to the Chinese, when you have to share your patents with your Chinese partners, that's a bad idea. And most companies and manufacturing companies are starting to realize that. They realize that you really don't own a factory in China. You, you're renting a factory in China from the Chinese Communist Party. But the one area that, that, uh, of our economic sector, and it happens to be incredibly powerful, that that's just is in love with China, is Wall Street. You know, you've got guys like Ray Dalio and Schwartzman and these guys who just, you know, they, they, they love China. And, and there's a lot to love about the Chinese people. Uh, don't get me wrong. But the Chinese Communist Party is a, is a very threat to our liberty. And they keep investing in China because they, they think eventually China's going to become free. Maybe they think that. I, at least I hope that's their, their motivation. And, and they think that their, their bank or their hedge fund or their, the return they're going to get in their investment from investing in Chinese companies uh, is, is going to make them rich. I mean, I, I, what I used to say is that there are a lot of houses in the Hamptons that were built by the Chinese Communist Party. And there are a lot of nice houses in the Hamptons that were built by the CCP. And, and it was a pretty, pretty cheap way for the CCP to have tremendous access in this country. But look, we're a free country, and there, there's only so much we can do to, to regulate what American companies want to do. But what I tell them is, if a war breaks out in the Chinese, in the Taiwan Straits, and between the America and China, or relations get worse, there are going to be heavy economic sanctions. I mean, the, the toolkit that America has immediately in a war is economic sanctions, because we want to avoid uh, rights into a kinetic level. Now, that may not be true in the Taiwan Strait if there's an invasion of Taiwan, but if there's a blockade or uh, cyber attacks or, or actions against Taiwan, the first reaction in America is going to be economic sanctions. But the Chinese have been preparing for that for many years, and they're, they're trying to suck as much American investment, especially from Wall Street, into China as they can, because they don't want their bonds canceled, they don't want their dollar holdings canceled, they want to have something to fight back with, and the way they'll fight back is by nationalizing U.S. investment in China. So the more U.S. investment they can get in China, the more leverage they can have over us, and the more they can mitigate any financial sanctions down the road in the event of a conflict or a, a crisis between the countries. Now, the Wall Street guys think, well, that's OK, because the US government will bail us out. We always get bailed out. We're too big to fail. Wall Street, it doesn't matter what happens, Wall Street gets bailed out. The little guy may go bankrupt, but Wall Street's going to get bailed out. And I, I assume they feel that they're going to get bailed out, but I think the, the consensus, the American public is not going to go for bailing out BlackRock or, or any of these country, companies that, that have made massive bets on China. I mean, and, and beyond that, there's a patriotic issue there. And you know, I understand you know, money, you know, money doesn't sleep, and we've got to chase the best returns, and that sort of thing we can get as a, as a fiduciary and a banker and that sort of thing. But to invest in companies that, that, that are building warships or airplanes that are going to be used to kill American servicemen and women, our sons and daughters who are uh, serving in, in, in the armed services, there's something very concerning about that. To invest in companies that, that are abusing the Uyghurs, uh, I mean, we, we've got, think about it today. It's 2023, it's August 2023. There are slaves picking cotton in China today. And think about that, just that image that there are slaves picking cotton in China. And we've got American companies that are buying those products from, made from that slave labor. There are, there are Chinese, there are Uyghur men being sent to vocational camp, quote, vocational camps, uh, work camps, and their, their wives, are, they're being replaced by Han Chinese because of the one China policy, and there are too many Chinese males, and Han Chinese men are being moved into their homes with these Uyghur women. I mean, when you think about what's going on, this, this isn't a, 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 a contest of ideas that people talk about. Well, they've got an autocratic system, or they've got this hybrid system, and they, it's more efficient. This is a choice between liberty and, and the worst form of totalitarianism. And so to have, have American companies, big companies on Wall Street, saying, well, we, gotta get a, we can get a, a slightly better rate of return. There's no better investment that we can make in America or in Europe or in Vietnam or the Philippines or, or India. There's no better rate of return that we can get than investing in, in, in you know, a company that's either in China that's dual, dual use, that's going to make... Uh, uh, platforms that kill American kids in, in uniform, or that are abusing Uyghurs, or, or, or just even abusing the people of, of China, uh, that, that's, that's something that I, I think some of these, these wealthy guys, and I, maybe if you've got a billion dollars or $10 billion or $50 billion, and you like some of these masters of the universe on Wall Street, they don't care. But they ought to look in the mirror and think about what they're doing and how much is enough. I mean, it's, uh, I, I say this as a Republican. I'm, I'm all for free enterprise and making as much money as you can. That 
taking advantage of the opportunities you've got in this country to become wealthy. But, but to use your money in, in, that, fa in that sense, you know, it, it took a long time for, for people to get over investments in, in Nazi Germany in the 30s, a long time. And I think, I think at some point, some of these companies that are investing in China are gonna face that same moral reckoning. And, and I think it's gonna be sooner rather than later. And they really ought to look in the mirror and decide if they're if they doing the right thing, as, as not just as Americans, but as human beings. Excellent. Uh, um, I just have one uh, follow-up comment on that. Uh, during the Cold War, you know, uh, uh, we fought against the uh, Soviet Union, uh, which was the primary uh, adversary of the United States. Uh, today, many people say we're in a similar situation with China. Uh, but the fundamental difference between the Soviet Union and China today is that in the Soviet days, uh, virtually there's no major uh, lobby group for Soviet Union yeah. within the United States. Not Wall Street, not K Street. Uh, uh, very few on, on Massachusetts Avenue, <laughs> think tank row. Uh, today is totally different. Yeah. China basically uh, advanced its interests mostly through lobbyists yeah. on Wall Street, K Street, and Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, that's a very, very telling. And uh, so uh, you and I both serve uh, yeah. in the administration, uh, the previous administration, and I can say one of the, uh, my proudest moment, uh, achievement, I think, is that we, uh, under Secretary Pompeo's great leadership, uh, we almost completely uh, repulsed the push uh, from the lobby group um, on China's behalf. And uh, I personally have several encounters uh, of that kind. So, um, okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say, you, you did a terrific job, Miles, and at the State Department, and Secretary, Secretary Pompeo was a, you know, I, I initially worked for Mike as a hostage envoy and then went on to be his, his colleague as National Security Advisor. You and Mike did incredible work. and. Uh, but for, for this country, but not just for this country, but for, for people around the world, including people in China, by, by promoting freedom the way you did. And, and Secretary Pompeo's declaration of a genocide, I think it was on January 19th, uh, following what Secretary Blinken had talked about in the campaign, and Secretary Blinken's kept that declaration in, in place, uh, was, was a milestone. And, and so th th thank you for the tremendous work. And on Huawei, I mean, when I first became the National Security Advisor, folks came in a briefing and said, there's nothing we can do about Huawei. They've taken over. They're going to have control of all the data in the world. They're going to have every cloud, you know, every every transaction that takes place on a mobile phone anywhere in the world is going to go through some sort of Huawei station. So we'll have to figure out how to encrypt it to keep it from the Chinese. And, and I said, no, we're not going to do that. And talked to Mike, and Mike said, we're going to give this a shot. And we pushed back on Huawei. And, and not only did we push back, we won. And America's allies in the free world, for the most part, has eschewed Huawei because they they they, they came to understand the danger presented by Huawei. That, that fight on Huawei where we were told it can't be won, we won it. And it was primarily you and Keith Kroc and, and, and Secretary Pompeo over at the state and Larry Kudlow in the White House and, and our team, uh, Brian Kavanaugh who's here and others. Uh, I hate to name people because I think I'm going to get sanctioned by the Chinese and they'll get in trouble. <laughs> you, you, can tell, you can tell from my comments today why I'm not going back to Beijing for a holiday anytime soon. But uh, um, the, the work you did was tremendous. But uh, there's one, one final comment on the lobbyist. The Chinese have a lot of money. And what the Soviet Union didn't have was the kind of wealth that the Chinese have generated. The Chinese have generated massive wealth. We've never faced the challenges as Americans like we're facing against communist China now. Maybe in the revolution, maybe when we're fighting England, the UK is a, the dominant superpower in the world to get our independence. But since that time, we haven't faced a challenge. And one of the reasons this challenge is, is because the Chinese use every tool of national power, including their economic weight, to hire former congressmen, former, former officials, uh, and they either hire them through TikTok or, or through a Chinese company, or they hire them directly as lobbyists, and then they fight in the halls of Congress and in the administration to promote China's agenda here in America. Now, think about this. If America and American companies hired a bunch of former Chinese officials in Beijing to go into the Communist Party, into the people's, the Great Hall of the People, into the, the Congress, the Central Committee, as basically foreign agents to advocate for America, how long do you think those, those lobbyists in China would last? I mean, they'd be taken out faster than Hu Jintao got, got escorted out of the party congress uh, uh, that, that we all saw on TV. So there's no reciprocity, but we, we're, because we're open and the Chinese understand our, our system, they're taking advantage of it. And, and the lobbyists are just one example. And, and you standing up to them and Secretary Pompeo standing up to them and, and keeping them out of the State Department was just terrific and we're very, we're very proud of what you did. Well, thank you for those remarks. I think you know the, the, the amazing thing is everything that we have discussed today 
has been so obvious for decades. Yeah. It takes leadership of enormous courage and who, that placed American interest at first, that really translated all these observations, the very obvious facts, into policy. And I'm so glad to be a part of the team under Secretary Pompeo. It's a team. And so uh, the, the surrounding uh, uh, Pompeo and uh, I'm sure in the White House leadership, and uh, uh, we have uh, a tremendous group of colleagues. I'm very proud to be part of them, uh, part of the uh, great effort. So uh, uh, let's just go to the audience uh, today. So please uh, uh, state your question, and if you uh, have a statement or analysis, please frame the, your answer in the form of a question as well. Like Jeopardy, reverse Jeopardy, yeah. Author. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my um, wonderful presentation, uh, great discussion, great legacy. Um, it's been interesting watching the trajectory of the current administration when it comes to China. At the very beginning, I think we all felt that they seemed to be following the lead that the previous administration had taken and understood the adversarial nature of our dealings with China. It was important to be strong uh, and even confrontational uh, in certain key areas. Um, but over time, it seems that the attitude has shifted to one of a more accommodationist approach in dealing with China, especially recently. Um, the article that you and I did for foreign affairs um, stressed the role that Congress could play in helping and deal with an adversary like China, the steps and the policies that that Congress could follow. And I think we have to say Mike Gallagher with the Select Committee and others have done a magnificent job in following up and, and, and pushing ahead with those measures. But you and I know that there is no substitute for having an executive branch that fully understands the nature of the China threat and is willing to use the tools that it has at its disposal to push back on China's bid for global hegemony from supply chains all the way through to the pressure that it brings to bear on, on the Taiwan Straits, uh, and all over, all over the Indo-Pacific area, and now in Europe. So my question for you is, let's suppose there's a change of administration after the election uh, uh, this, uh, in November 2024. Uh, from your perspective, what would be the two or three most important things that a new administration could do to deal with that China threat? Yeah, that's a great question. I, and look, I, I, I've complimented the Biden administration where they've where they've done the right thing on China, and I think they've kept a lot of our policies in place, the things that Miles worked on and and, and others did. Uh, I think Jake Sullivan has been particularly good, the national security advisor on China, uh, but they they face the same issues that we faced. You know, Treasury, which is riddled with Wall Street folks, uh, is very accommodationist towards China. You see Janet Yellen, you know, going to to China and bowing to Xi Jinping and. Uh, uh, you know, kowtowing in, in a way that we haven't seen in many years. Uh, that was not a good sign, especially on the heels of the, the Chinese spy balloon that brazenly you know, came across our country uh, on the heels of finding out that, you know, there are reports, and we'll have to see how they play out, that the Chinese had a weapons lab in California that they were running. So, you know, the, the, the Chinese are continuing to keep up their malign activity, and we need to keep the pressure on them. And, and so the, some of these visits to China and the, the attempts, and, and look, it, it's reasonable. Appeasement is, is, is something that in a democracy is very popular because we think other people are like us. We, we, we project our beliefs and our, our kind of reasonableness on other people. So we think if we stretch out our hand and say, look, we want to get along, we want to work things out with you, we'll get the reciprocity from the other side. We'll never get reciprocity. They'll, they'll take whatever we give them and then say, what have you done for me lately? There, there, there's no... There's, there's no uh, benefit from from this one-sided diplomacy. If we give you something now, you'll you'll be considerate of us later. You'll you'll do the right thing later. You'll apologize for the spy balloon. You'll tell us that the Wuhan lab had an accidental leak and we got COVID and it wasn't your fault, but it happened. And how do we work to prevent it again? That will never happen with a communist party, the Communist Party of China, or any communist party. So we need to understand that. So going to your question, so so I think it's been a mixed bag with the administration. I think we got. We have some, some hawks on China, Kurt Campbell and, and Jake Sullivan at the NSC. I think you've got Yellen. I think you've got a lot of the people we worked with at the State Department that just want to do diplomacy and, and have agreements and accommodations and appeasement and go back to how it was in the old days with China. I think Secretary Blinken's been pretty good, but uh, you know, I, I don't think he's been, uh, he certainly hasn't been Mike Pompeo uh, with, with China. Uh, so, you know, I mean, 
Look, the Chinese are so brutal, they even, their own foreign minister disappeared. I mean, we don't even know what happened to their foreign minister. I mean, can you imagine if Tony Blinken just disappeared <laughs> and, we were, and, and was scrubbed from the State Department and no one in the news media was able to mention his name? I mean, that, that, this, that's the type of regime we're dealing with. Going back to your question about what we can do in a new uh, administration or what, I don't want to say a new administration, what this administration should do. Number one, I think we're facing a crisis uh, with agricultural and farmland purchases in America. These aren't, the, some of them are mysterious, but most of them are, are openly and notoriously Chinese, but the Chinese are very interested in buying agricultural land in America, uh, not for their own food security, but they happen to be particularly interested in agricultural land that's around air bases, whether it's in Air Force bases in Grand Forks, North Dakota, or Lachlan, Texas, or Travis Air Force Base out in Sacramento that all the, all the land and acreage around these Air Force bases is being bought up by the Chinese. The fact that we're allowing that is, is beyond absurd. I mean, you can't, you can't even understand what, what's going on. And then we're allowing them to build buildings with line of sight to the airfields and, and, and cell phone towers and buying property next to our nuclear sites. Uh, so, so that's an area that we, we need to end that now. I mean, some state governments are trying to do something, but this a, requires federal action. We would never let the Soviets do that to us. And, and the Chinese would never lie. If we said, hey, we want to, America's coming in, we're going to buy all the farmland around the People's Liberation Army rocket forces bases in China, we're sure you're fine with that, and we're going to build buildings and bring in American workers to staff those, that property. And that's absurd, number one. Number two is the, the, this outbound investment in China. One of the things that Larry Kudlow and I did, and Gene Scalia got on board with us uh, at the Labor Department, uh, we had the Federal Thr Thrift Savings Plan that was investing in funds that were in turn investing in, in, in Chinese companies that were doing dual-use dual manufacturing, ships and aircraft. So we had the retirement funds of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines going into a fund that was then in turn investing in, in Chinese companies uh, that were uh, building military equipment. I mean, we stopped that. Uh, we've got to stop all U.S. outbound investment. We need a, kind of a reverse CFIUS process that we should not allow American money to go to China. Number one, it's totally risky for the investor. You know, keep in mind, the people that are investing in this, the, 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 the Ray Dalios and these people, this is OPM, this is other people's money. They're not putting their own money at risk. They make their money off fees for doing the investment and their, their funds. They're taking American retirement money and putting it into China, knowing that it very well could be shut off the second there's a crisis because of sanctions that the Chinese will nationalize it. So we've got to protect American retirees and protect our, our, our servicemen and women uh, from that sort of investment. So those are, those are two things we could do right, right away. And then the third thing we need to do, which we can proactively do, and it doesn't, and again, those first two steps are things we can do without any cooperation from the Chinese. Those are American actions dealing with American farmland, American investment funds. Uh, the third thing is, goes to rare earth minerals, because we talk about semiconductors, we talk about phones, we talk about EVs, we want to have a greener economy. We need rare earth elements to be able to, to make those products. And one of the things we can do is we can mine the rare earths here. We can mine them in Australia. We can mine them in Greenland. We have all the rare earth minerals we need domestically and with our closest allies. But we can't process them because we won't allow a processing plant to be built. So either in Greenland or Australia or Texas or somewhere here, we need to build a processing plant. And we need to start extracting rare earths and, and process them here so that the free world has access to rare earth minerals to build the, 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 the semiconductors and, the, and the, all, all the equipment and, and batteries that we need for, the, for our defense and for the economy of the future. And we can do that domestically and, and with our close allies. We don't need to rely on the Chinese for that. So those are the three steps that, that this administration could take. I don't think we should wait for a new administration. This is some the, these are three steps the Biden administration could take right now to increase our security, increase our economic security, our national security, and, and protect us and our supply chains from China. And, and we don't need any cooperation from, from China or any, any other country to, to, to achieve those results. So the great question, Arthur. Thank you. Uh, there, the lady over there. Ambassador Bryan, thank you so much. Michelle Beckering from USGLC. We're big fans. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit and pick up on what you were talking about, um, friend and ally shoring earlier. It seems to me if we're going to effectively compete with China, we've also got to do it sort of outside our borders and be more globally engaged. You know this, but every time I go to Sub-Saharan Africa or the Asian Pacific, I don't care how remote of a region I'm in, the Chinese are there. The investments are there, the flag is there. 
And when you talk to, you know, those leaders or those business owners, they all say the same thing. We would love to trade with the United States. We would love, you know, your foreign direct investment. But one, we're either not there or the Chinese are there and, you know, up front with all their bags of money and no strings attached, right? We know it's debt trap diplomacy, but they still seem like they're getting there first. And so would just like your thoughts on that, because it seems to me if we're going to really effectively compete with them, we've got to do it in those regions of the world where we've been a little hesitant um, to do that investment. And so just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, so that's a great question, Michelle. And, and look, America has to be engaged uh, well, you know, around the world. I mean, the, the, you know, we've got so much goodwill around the world that we don't recognize. The people speak English. They love American music. They love American culture. They, we've got soft power that no other country can match. Uh, and, and combined with our allies, with the British and the French, uh, uh, the, this, the, the you know, influence that we have around the world is tremendous. And, and I, I'm like you, Michelle. I, I used to travel a lot as an international arbitration lawyer and arbitrator to you know, all over Africa, all over Asia. And wherever you go, and Miles, you've seen this, there's always a sign up that says, this road is being brought to you by the people of the People's Republic of China. Or, this, this road is a gift to the people of Kenya. Or, the, the, these fiber optic lines are a gift from the people of China to the people of Rwanda. And I, w I went to the East Asia Summit as National Security Advisor the President designated me as his, uh, his envoy to the, the East Asia Summit and the APAC meeting. I think some of the heads of state weren't very happy to see a staffer there instead of President Trump, but you know, they, they, they got stuck with me. Uh, and I, I asked my staff beforehand because the common refrain we were getting from everyone was, America is abandoning Asia, America is abandoning ASEAN, we're not there. Uh, I, I thought this is very concerning, and so I asked my staff, put together what our investment is in, these, in, this, in the ASEAN region, and compared to the Japanese and the Chinese, our, our competitors in that area. And, uh, and they did so. The, the, the results were shocking, and I, I said this in my plenary statement, we had invested over $1 trillion in Asia, in, in, the, the, in the ASEAN countries. China and Japan combined had invested just over $500 billion. So we were 2x China and Japan combined. But the narrative was America's pulled out, America's abandoned the region. And the reason for that is, I think, twofold. Number one, most of our investment came from American companies. The Microsofts, the Googles, the Boeings, the Exxons, our, our great American companies who are there with their company brand name, you know, Caltex on a, on a, on a service station, uh, with a Chevron, I think it's Chevron Exxon or some sort of a Standard Oil uh, consortium, uh, but, but not USA. And so the, the Chinese were touting what they were doing, and our investment over China was 3x, over China and Japan together was 2x. We weren't broadcasting that, and, and so the narrative had taken, had taken hold, and it was a narrative that was fed by the Communist Party of China and their propaganda machine, is that America doesn't care, America's gone, America's abandoned you, when in fact we were there 2x, uh, 2 or 3x China as far as investment in the economies of those countries. So number one, we, we, need, we need to let people know we're different than China. When you get an investment from a U.S. company, that's not coming from the U.S. government, but it's the American people. It's, it's, it's the American way of life that's coming and investing in your country. And it, it might be under the guise of GE building a, a gas turbine plant in Vietnam, which we signed a deal for when I was National Security Advisor. But, but it doesn't necessarily say USA across the top of it. But the second thing is, and we try to do this branding, and you know, people said that's childish and America doesn't do this, but we send so much foreign aid overseas, sacks of grain and rice and equipment and that sort of thing. And it, it'll say, it'll have you know, all kinds of different labels on it. We came up with a label with an American flag it's a, a gift from the people of the United States with a, a flag label on it, showing that it was coming from America. Just to let people know, you know, at, at a, the more subsistence level, foreign aid, that, that you're getting, this is a, a gift from the American people to your country. And, and we're, not, we, we're not giving 10% of it to your leader in a Swiss bank account. We're not going to come collect on the debt that we're giving you. This, this is aid that's coming from the American people because we want to see you do, do well and succeed and, and not, not go hungry. And unfortunately, that, that, has, that program, I don't believe, has gone forward. But we need to do a better job but with our private sector investment of letting people know that this is, these private sector companies are a result of the free enterprise system that we have in America. And we need to get our companies more involved in letting people know that you know, this is American or Western investment. But number two, on the direct investment that we do and the, the foreign aid that we give as a country, we need to brand it and market it and let people know and not be shy about it. But you know, look, there's something about the Judeo-Christian ethic that we have that you don't want to tell people, Miles, you don't, I don't want to come say, hey, I'm giving you this and it's from me and, and you owe me something for it. 
I mean, it's, it's not our, we, we, we do things, we want you know, the, the right hand not to know what the left hand is doing when we're giving charity. And yet that's not how things work in the world. And we need to be a little bit more uh, upfront about letting countries know that, that the American people are supporting them and that we're, we're helping them out. Uh, not not in, a, in a way to make them dependent, but in a way to make them prosperous and, uh, and help them stand up. And, and the Chinese do a very good job of that. They, they, they let you know every little thing they do for you, even if, even if they're gonna eventually you know, take the collateral back and, and own half your country. But uh, I think we need to do a better job explaining what the American business does and what the American government does overseas so that the folks know that we are engaged and that we're not isolationists and we care about you know, what's happening with our friends and allies and we care what's happening in deepest Africa and, and the farthest reaches of Asia that America cares. So. I totally agree with that. We need to do a better job of explaining American's effort uh, as a whole but not to, uh, to make excuse for uh, inaction. Uh, understated, unreported the good deeds ultimately would generate a tremendous inspiration of power and influence. Uh, just read the recent uh, uh, Pew public opinion poll of 24 countries. Uh, China's reputation, global reputation, uh, is just terrible uh, overall. I mean, 67% average uh, of the 24 countries have a negative view of China. So despite all this money yeah. spent, ultimately the nature of the regime and then the, the, the strategic intention of, the, uh, of China's uh, global outreach will be revealed to people sooner or later. Next question. Uh, over there, yeah, this side. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, my name is Vishav. I'm a rising senior at Berkeley, so go Bears, first of all. Um, but this I just wanted to- This is a Cal alumni meeting here. This is great. Yeah, it, it feels a, a little rare in DC, much like you said. Um, but I wanted to shift attention to industry, which is a very big sort of component in this conversation, whether it be semiconductors or sort of, you know, at large emerging technology and our sort of interests and competition with China. Um, We've seen a lot of action in terms of you know, export controls and recent talks about, out, about investment. Um, but we also have seen industry pushed back against a lot of these actions that the current administration has taken uh, or is planning to take. And I think coupled with the fact that there's also sort of you know, theories at times that people say this pushes the PRC to actually have capabilities on their own and have less reliance on the West or us. Um, how do you balance sort of the need to at some, at some level, first of all, cooperate with our industry and ensure that our industry is able to be profitable and maintain this uh, presence in the Indo-Pacific, but at the same time assuring that you know, we are not um, furthering China's interests at some level. Yeah, so I think that's a, a really good question. It's a, it's a hard question. It's hard to figure out what the balance is. What I've always said is that I, I've never advocated a complete decoupling with China. Uh, I, I think the best way to do business with China is to sell China things. And just like we buy a lot of things from China, uh, we should sell China things. And China should have an open market so that we can sell our farm products, our uh, agricultural goods, our uh, minerals, oil, oil and gas as we, if we produce more, uh, raw materials, uh, films, and, and entertainment products. There's a lot the Chinese want from us, and there's a lot we can sell. And selling things into China is good because it, it, it furthers uh, you know, the the interest of America, it reduces the trade deficit. And, and so I, I, the idea that we should trade with China is, is a good idea. Traditionally, Australia has done very well with China because they've sold things into China. The problem is, is when you invest in China, that's when they get their hands and their, their grips in you. They, they make you, they force you to t transfer technology to them. They, they force you to, as soon as your company is doing well, and I was involved in a couple of cases like this, they, they try and buy your company at a fire sale rate. Uh, or they prevent you from doing further business and, and put one of their companies in, in place. Uh, they, they build a parallel factory next to your factory and, and start knocking off the same goods so that the workers that were, building, that were doing a brand name American product in the morning are going to the factory next door and doing a, a knockoff at night. And so, so I think that kind of trade with, with China obviously isn't helpful, but selling things into China is good. And the, the question you ask is, where do you make the distinction of something that is dual use or could be turned around and used against us, or it could be reverse engineered or that sort of thing. And what can we sell into China knowing that it's not a big problem? Legacy chips are an area where we could probably sell into China and, and you know, sell them products that, that aren't so advanced that they're gonna give China a technolo technological advantage in a war fighting scenario. Uh, and, and so we just need to make those calls. But the idea of exporting things to China, good. 
the idea of going into China and setting up your company and, and working in China is more problematic and riskier. Uh, but we, we do have to, you know, the idea isn't to cut off all trade with China, but the, the Chinese don't see it that way. They, they really don't want to buy things from us unless they have to. They really don't want to buy things from other countries unless they have to. They really want to, they've got kind of an autarkic system where they want to, you know, make everything they can in China and sell outward. It's mercantilistic, it's autarkic, and, and, and we need to avoid playing into that trap. But selling our goods, selling California agriculture and, and Midwestern agricultural products uh, to China, selling films to China is great, but even in those fronts, if the Chinese get upset with you, they restrict the imports, just like they did with uh, Australian wine or, or with the film industry where they only allow 10 or 12 American films and then they, they use that access for those films to, to censor uh, the films, you know, to take the, the, the Taiwan patch off Maverick's uh, bomber jacket and Top Gun. Uh, so so we, selling into China is, is generally a good idea if we can do it without uh, hurting our, our national security. And, and if we get the Chinese to open their market to, do, to, to allow that to happen, that would be a good thing for everybody. That, that's, that's what free trade is supposed to be about, but we haven't had free trade, trade with China for many years. Great, great question. Uh, I have to apologize because uh, we have a time uh, uh, limit. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, so uh, I wish you could go on. To further engage with us and China Center here, please visit our website, uh, hotson.org. And uh, please join me uh, for a round of applause for our Thank you, speaker. Thank you very much, Robert. <laughs>